<laughs> can you read, are you are you good at reading from the Bible? Sir? Well, I guess it could be. Yeah, I would love uh, if you would read Luke thirteen, Luke 13. six through nine, and um, you, you're wearing a CCCB shirt, so that makes you staff. Would you hold that where he can speak into it? Luke six, uh, Luke 13, thirteen, six through nine. Can I just tell you before he starts? I think. This is one of the most terrifying parables that Jesus tells. Alright, so it's, it's appropriately spooky to start things out. And uh, so, yeah, Luke 13, 6 through 9. Okay. You said Luke 13, 6 through 9. That's it. Okay, I'm here. <clears throat> like like blue shirt. The new Bible or a different one, so get it right. like blue shirt. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. <clears throat> the gardener answered, Sure, give me just one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get fixed next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Thank you. It's sober, right? I hope everybody here has had a time in your life when you have felt fruitful. I don't mean when you had kids. I mean, the, the work that you're doing produces fruit. And there's times where it just feels like things are coming together, and things are working, and I, I work and I see a return on my labor, and, and it feels like I'm happening to things instead of things happening to me. And there's times in our life where we feel really fruitful. I'm moving forward, stuff's happening. There's also been times in my life, and maybe in yours, I was going to say, if you're at this workshop, then probably this resonates with you, but then I found out there's no other workshops at this time, so <laughs> you're here whether this resonates with you or not. <laughs> but there's probably been some times in your life where you feel like, I'm kind of stuck right now. Nothing's really going the way I'm hoping it would go. Um, I don't really see fruit being produced. I don't really feel like I'm moving forward. I'm just kind of stuck. Has anybody, and I'm, I'm just going to be bold here, we'll do a show again. Has anybody ever felt like that? Most of us, right? This is a pretty common experience. A couple people over here have never felt that way, but like most of us have. Phil Marley's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, hey, um, you know, before we do anything else, anything else I'm just going to tell you this is how it works. Uh, stuck happens. At some point, stuck happens to everybody, mm -hmm. right? And that's if you're if you're a blank filler out, or you can fill out blanks. I firmly believe that uh, people who fill in the blanks are not more spiritual than the people who do not fill in the blanks. But if you're the kind of person who likes to have blanks to fill in, I wanted to make sure that you had something to do during this hour. All right. So that's your first blank right there. Is stuck happens. Uh, stuck happens to everybody. It's happened to you in the past. Or it's happening to you right now, or it's going to happen to you in the future. And how we respond to that matters a lot. How we push through or don't matters a lot in our spiritual life and the spiritual lives of those around us. Um, I, I kind of have an idealized version of what I want my life to look like. And if my life was a stock market, what I want is everything always going up and to the right. You know what I'm talking about? So, if this is it, that's the life I want to live. Unfortunately, my life is more like the actual stock market. Stock market. <laughs> <laughs> right? What I want is up and to the right. But what I actually experience is highs, lows, plateaus, stuff in the middle. There's times that I think, man, things are going really well. There's times where I think, man, I don't know how things are going. There's times when I think, when can this season end for <clears throat> Right? And I've experienced all those things, and probably a lot of you have too. Well, there's three kinds of stuck. Or there's, I said three. There's four kinds of stuck. That's a typo in your, man, 
Who made these out? Who made these out? <laughs> There's four kinds of stuck. We're going to get to it on the next page. Don't worry about it. We'll get there. There's four kinds of stuck that we're going to talk about <coughs> in our time together today. Um, and here's the advice that doesn't work for any of them. You just got to do more. This is what I've usually been told. I go to a, a friend, I go to somebody in my church, um, I say, man, I just really feel, I just feel dry right now, you know? Like, I just feel like, I know, I know God's there, but I'm just not feeling close to Him, I'm not feeling His presence, it just doesn't feel fruitful, the work I'm doing doesn't feel, I just feel, and almost always what somebody says to me is, how much do you read your Bible? Hey, are you spending enough time in prayer? Uh, hey, what, what, what are you? Are you in some sort of a group with other people where you're confessing your sins to them? And they're, hey, what? Uh, when was the last time that you, uh, you know, just tell, tell me all the things I'm not doing? I get it, and that's not wrong. But I'll tell you, of the kinds of stuck we're going to talk about today, the answer to the to getting unstuck for me has never been, hey, you kind of stink because you're not doing enough. If you would just buckle down and do more you would be better. Mm. I've tried that. In fact, trying to do more and more and more and more and more is usually what leads to me feeling stuck in the first place. Now, maybe you're just a complete slacker and you're lazy and you don't ever get off the couch. In that case, you probably should do some more. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but for a lot of us, and especially, i got to say, I'm, I'm trying to figure out I'm trying to calibrate. So some of you that have been through more than me, maybe you know better than me, but I'm, it's either because I have teenagers now or it's because of this post-COVID thing, but like, it just feels like, like has the world always been this exhausting? <laughs> no. Maybe it has. I got, like I said, I got a 16-year-old who just started driving two weeks ago, so that's its own level of exhausting. And I got a 13-year-old and I got an 8-year-old. And, uh, and each one of them is needed more and more and more time. It's like, I just take, I just feel like I can drive, all I do is drive kids to things and drop them off at things, and coach basketball games. And, like, maybe it's that, or maybe it's COVID, or maybe it's life. I don't know what it is. But man, I'm doing a lot. I didn't know a person could do this much stuff. I read my Bible every day, and pray, I read books, I worship, I'm in a group, doing all the stuff I'm supposed to do. Sometimes I just feel dry. I feel stuck. I feel like, man, I'm not sure what's going on. Or what the next thing looks like. Has anybody felt that? Is that just me? Me and Phil Marley. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to I want to show you my, my grandfather's clock. It's been really helpful for me. Um, it's a simple visual illustration. Uh, has anybody ever read Genesis 1? It's <laughs> yeah. the very beginning. Uh, there's something that God says. No, not, not quote God in that all of scriptures God breathed as useful for teaching, rebuke, and correcting, training, and righteousness. But actually, it's not verbally said by God, but it's said by it's said in Genesis 1. There's something that's said about every day of the days of creation. Do you know what it is? So, hold on, we got multiple things going on here. So several people said it's good. That's true of most of the days, but not all the days. You rested on the last day, but not every day. There's something that's said about every single day in Genesis 1. There's more. That's it. All right. There's more than there's It's a ringer in every crowd. All right. And there was morning. Uh, no, no, no. You were wrong, actually. That's right. What it actually says in Genesis, and it was evening and it was morning the first day. It was evening and morning the second day, evening and morning the third day, evening and morning the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh day. Which is odd, right? It's very strange. That's not how I conceptualize anything about my day. When I go to bed, that's the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And when I wake up, that's the beginning. Right? So if I'd have written the New Testament, or the Old Testament, Genesis is in the Old Testament. <laughs> if I were in the Old Testament, I'd have said it was morning, morning and evening the first day, morning and evening the second, morning and evening the third, and so on. But the system that God lays out in Genesis 1 is that the evening is first and then the morning. And we still we see this all the way through into the New Testament. We 
uh, like in the crucifixion narrative of Jesus, um, that like if you ever get into this thing where you try and count how long Jesus was in the grave by the hours, you're like, wait, is it really three days? Right. Like, it, we don't have, it's only integers here. Right? We're not doing decimals. Right. But um, but the reason that it's three days is because the evening's first, right? And so um, and or they were like, hey, why is the what's the deal with the Passover? Why does Passover work that way? It's because Sabbath starts in the evening at sundown the previous day and it's the next day. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of ways you can take that. There's a lot of things you can do with that. But one of the observations that we make is, unlike us, I think the day starts when I start my activity. God seems to say in Genesis, or at least say strongly imply, depending on your interpretive paradigm, it seems to imply that the day starts with rest and goes to work. Mm. Instead of starting with work, and going to rest. My paradigm is I rest and recuperate. Right? I work as hard as I can, and then I crash, and then as soon as I'm mostly able to go up again, then I get up and do it again. That's a different paradigm than the paradigm of the Old Testament. Right? So the Old Testament has this idea that what we have is we have rest and work. And then in the New Testament, in John 15, Jesus has this great final speech to his apostles. And one of the things he talks about in John 15 is this famous, famous, um, not really a parable, analogy of the the vine and the branches. He says, here's what you've got to do. You need to be busy, busy, busy beavers for me. You just need to go out there and work, 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 because there is a dying world, and if you're not working, then you're not. No, he doesn't say that. So you're like, I don't think it says that. It doesn't. <laughs> what he says is, you need to abide in me. And if you abide in me, then you will bear much fruit. You've got to abide in me. Abiding is, technically to abide is a verb, but it's not a very active verb. Right? If you're abiding, it's like you're resting in Jesus. You're staying with Jesus. You're staying close to Jesus. My workaholic self doesn't ever like to abide. I want to go make something happen, right? Mm. Ah, be fruitful. But Jesus says, fruit happens when you have abode. But they didn't. I'm not actually sure. <laughs> but the new, par- the new Testament paradigm is abide to be fruitful. And he goes on. He says, um, "He says, if you're a branch that doesn't bear fruit, I'm going to cut that branch off and throw it away. Burn it. Yeah. Okay, I definitely want to bear fruit, so I don't get cut. And then the next verse says, but if you do bear fruit, then I'm still going to cut it off and throw it away, but we're going to prune it back, right? Mm-hmm. We've got vines and I'm learning how to prune and cherry trees now and I'm learning how to prune. And I, I've got this beautiful tree and it's like, ah, oh, so good. It's really coming in nice. I want to let those things grow. My dad's been teaching me about pruning. He's like, nope, that will, that's got to go. That's got to go. That branch has got to come out. And, oh, that, man, that branch bore so much fruit. It's like, it's got to go. If you want fruit next year, that's got to be pruned back. Right? And it's generally not the case that if, when I'm being pruned, it's easy for me to tell the difference between pruning and cutting. So either way, the same snippers are coming out. Does that make sense? And so what we have here is we have this kind of continuum. I'm, I'm going to draw. I want you to imagine a grandfather clock with a pendulum that just swings back and forth. Sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here. We've got a grandfather clock that swings back and forth between abiding and fruitfulness, between work and rest. And the key idea of this word picture, 
Anybody have kids and push your kids on the swing? Mm -hmm. Now, here's what you can do. You can go right up to where the kid is sit, hanging straight down, and you can go right up there and push the kid. And what's going to happen is you're going to get a swing full of kid that hits you right you know, below the waist. Like, that's just how that always works. The kid goes, comes back, swats you. The professional dad way to do it is to pick the kid up in the swing, pull him way back, and then let him go. Right? That's how a kid learns to swing. So you have to pull it back and let it go. You can't, you can't actually do that much pushing. He's like, push me, Daddy, push me, right? You can't push that much. Really, the secret for a kid to learn how to swing themselves is to pull. Learn to go with it, right? In the same way, if we think about this grandfather the pendulum on this grandfather clock, right? What I want, if I got my way and I could do whatever I want, There's no pendulum here. What I have is this. And I just stay there all the time. Because I'm an American. <laughs> I want to be in peak productivity all the time. I want to be producing. I want to be fruitful. I want to be getting it done. I'm productive. I'm efficient. <clears throat> But you can't stay here. What ends up happening for me, my failure mode looks like this. I'm always afraid to draw, to draw back. I'm always afraid to abide. I'm always afraid to pull back and rest. I think I need to be in the work mode. So I never let myself, I never, I'm getting better at it in my old age. But it used to be a problem where I would I would never feel like I could pull back further than about like right here. I'm, st I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty close to the work side. Does that make sense? So what do you think happens if you're here? It means you only go to here. <coughs> Does this analogy make sense? A lot of us are afraid to rest. And then, I'm not sure why the swing never gets all the way up. We don't want to go backwards, so we never go forwards. Right? Hmm. Jesus said, you've got to learn to abide in me if you want to produce much fruit. And the only way that you get there is by learning to prune. So Jesus says, you've got to prune. There might be good things in your life that you're afraid to let go of. Because they're good. They're fruitful. It's like, man, maybe this is the only place in my life I'm so <coughs> fruit. I can't let that go. <clears throat> Most of us have too much going on in our life. And because of that, we don't get to see as much fruit as we'd like to see. It's a general principle. We're going to talk about it more specifically on the next page. But before I go on, you guys following me on this? Does that make sense? What I want for you and this is true physically this is how it always is the Old Testament principle is true in the physical the New Testament principle is true in the spiritual right? you've got to rest in order to work in the Old Testament and that's physically you've got to sleep, you've got to take the day off you've got to do this stuff the New Testament principle is like you've got to abide in order to be fruitful Paul says, I can, you know, that, that without Christ, I can do nothing. And I'm like, well, Paul, you must not be very talented, man, because I can do a lot of stuff without waiting for Jesus. In fact, let me show you all the stuff I can do without waiting for Jesus. Amen. I do that stuff all the time. You know what comes of that? Very little. I have been very active on Jesus' behalf when Jesus was not acting, asking me to be active. And what's funny about that is, I never get fruit out of that. But I'm, but I'm active. Is this resonating with you? You've experienced this? Yes. you got to figure out for you, what does it look like to abide in Christ and to actually tr put your trust in Him?
You're going to tell God what he needs to do? God, I'm going to do this thing and I want you to bless it. And you're going to ask him, God, what do you want me to do? All right? So let's turn the page. That's enough to grandfather clock. Let's talk about four kinds of stuff. This is from my highly scientific... Um, I mean, it's not scientific at all. This is just what I see. Maybe you say there's a fifth or a sixth or a seventh kind of stuff. Totally fine. Here's what I see. I see four kinds of stuff. The first kind of stuff is processing. And when you're in process on something, that means God is doing work in you, and you will not pass go. You will not collect $200 until that work is complete. The verse there first uh, is uh, Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And uh, when I was like in the 90s, we had a song remember, that we would sing and try He who began a good work in you. And we do this like this round. He will be faithful to complete it. Oh, you and me, the only ones. I appreciate you. Um, it, was, it was maybe it was big back in Ohio. I'll see you later. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and there's been times in my life when I've experienced that verse less as a promise and more as a threat. Hey, here's the deal, Micah. I'm doing something in you, and you don't get to move on until this is done. Have you experienced that? Where you think, God is doing something in me right now, and for my own protection, he is not going to let me proceed until he, is com he has completed this work. And what that means is, I'm going to be here for a while. I had a job, a couple jobs ago. Um, where I was miserable. Flat out miserable. I was just miserable. And I'm just asking God, like, God, what is going on? Like, surely you don't want me to be here. This is not good for God. This is not good. This is good. I'm miserable, right? Let me do something else. And nothing, like the least number of job opportunities I've ever had in my life. And then something would come up. I'm like, hey, I, I can do that job, God. I can do that. And I try and make it happen. It goes back to the whole thing. Like, hey, look, look, I can put my resume in and nothing happens. How long did I have to be in this stupid situation? And the answer was, until you're done. My idea of a successful life and God's idea of a successful life for me are rarely the same thing. God's goal in life is not for you to get a specific job, for you to get a specific accomplishment. His goal in life is to make you holy and more like Him. Mm. Sometimes, the most effective tool that he has at his disposal is discomfort. Right? And so there's times when I feel stuck, where I'm ready to move on, where God has not permitted me to move on, primarily because this, this is my, and I don't speak for him, but like, in retrospect, I go, man, until I learned that thing, it wasn't right for me to go forward. Has anybody experienced something like that? <clears throat> Three hands. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> They're not stuck. What's that? They're not stuck. They're not stuck. That's right. <laughs> They're sure for the food. Um, <laughs> but I'll just tell you, there might be a time in your life where you feel like, I'm done with this. A relationship. A job. A situation. A health concern a life situation, I don't know, whatever it is, where you think, God, can we just move on? God, I'm, I'm not enjoying this at all. I'm ready to be done. And God says, you're just going to have to wait and trust me. You're just going to have to wait. So I was in that job for about a year longer than I wanted to be. God did more in my heart in that year where I learned that he was faithful and I learned that he could be trusted and I learned that I didn't need to be in control of my life. He did more in my life in that one year than he'd done in the previous three or four years where everything was great and up and to the right. The things that we usually consider to be our worst days, if you look back on them later, you think, man, maybe that, when did I grow as much as I grew at that time? So, uh, the fertilizer, so <laughs> it said, you know, he who began a good work will carry it on to completion. Is that a promise or a threat? Either way, the fertilizer is the same. You gotta wait. When I say the fertilizer, what I'm saying is, go back to the parable at the beginning. The 
The master says, the tree is not bearing fruit. And the servant says, let me fertilize it a little bit longer and we'll see what happens. You've got to accept some fertilizer in your life. The most common fertilizer historically is the excrement of farm animals. <laughs> You're going to have to have a lot of that in your life. So, fill in the word for yourself. I'm going to send a Christian college in the Bible. I'm not going to spell it. <laughs> organic farming. Organic farming. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> High class organic fertilizer. We live in Cincinnati, and one of the things that the Cincinnati, do, uh, the Cincinnati Zoo does that I think is brilliant is they sell their elephant poop as fertilizer to local places. You can buy, buy the 50 pound sack. Uh, <laughs> elephant poop from Cincinnati uh, <coughs> Zoo elephants. Nice. And they can make a lot of apparently, it's very effective. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Four kinds of stuck. The first is stalled. Oh, it's processing. The second is stalled. And here's how that works. What brought you here won't get you there. Usually in my life, when I get to a point where I'm st I'm not getting much <laughs> forward momentum. I get in this mode where I feel like I just need to do more of what got me here, right? Dance with the one who brung you is the, is the March Madness version of that. You've got to dance with who brung you, right? And so, you know, what's really been effective at times in my life in the past is study. I've really learned a ton through study. I've grown a lot through study. And so what I just need to do is study more, right? That has rarely worked for me. So I'm gonna, I've got this uh, other handout that you've got. This is from... This is completely unoriginal. This is from the book Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. Um, I always run up talking about like spiritual disciplines or practices or stuff like that as the stuff to think in terms of, and that's been helpful for me a lot. But um, Gary Thomas in his book Sacred Pathways, he talks about eight different pathways. It sounds kind of like hippie-ish, but it's not that. Uh, so he's a great godly man. But he says, look, there's different ways that we tend to draw close to God. Right? Now I'm not, don't, don't hear this wrong. Jesus is the only way. Right? I'm not talking about many ways. I'm not, there's no theological, I'm talking about like when I talk drawing close to God, I mean emotionally feeling like I'm close to God. Right? And so I'll just run through this real quick. Um, he talks about the naturalist pathway which is drawing close to God through the wonder of creation. So I, uh, my family's a camping, um, a camping family, and so we go canoeing, we go hiking. Um, it takes me about a day of being out in the woods on a one-week trip. The first day, it just takes me that long just to get out of my own head. And then after that, it's a really spiritual experience for me. It's like, man, God, I feel close to you. Like one reason a lot of people are depressed is because we live in cities where we don't get to spend time in nature. God made nature for us, guys. That's what it's for. He made it for us. And we draw close to Him when we see His hand at work in nature. So, um, experiencing beauty, um, sensation, beauty. When we see beautiful things, we see artwork, we see whatever. We see something beautiful like that. Oh, man, that helps me draw close to God to see something beautiful. Um, <coughs> liturgy. Um, I know we're like, we are not liturgical people. Right? Not high church, no one else. But, uh, but there are liturgical pieces in our churches. I don't actually know where you guys go to church. Uh, I'm a frustration with my guy. So, um, like taking, the commun taking communion every week is important to me. It's just important that that happens every week. I had someone. Um, talking to a friend of a different church. He said, do you, really, do you think we're sinning by not taking communion every week? I'm not saying we're sinning. I'm just saying I wouldn't go to your church. <laughs> I don't want to fight about it. I'm just telling you that the most important thing on Sunday for me is not the sermon. It's communion. And if we don't take communion, like if I'm not taking communion, then that, I'm missing something significant. Mm. And that's Amen. a liturgical piece that's deeply meaningful for me. Right? Simplicity, I'm not going to go through all these, but simplicity, uh, confrontation, service, celebration, adoration, study. <coughs> this isn't really a personality assessment. In a personality assessment, I'm definitely this, I'm not really that thing, right? 
disc or Myers Briggs or whatever it is. Um, this isn't that. I think all of us do well to be able to encounter God in all of these ways. Right? Some of these come nat more naturally than others. But I'll just tell you, when I've been in study for a while, what happens is the law of diminishing returns. I start to study and it's like, man, this has really been good for me. And then I study for six more months and I'm like, yeah, I'm really learning a lot. And you keep doing it and keep doing it. It's like, man, you need to go outside and touch grass. Right? Like, <laughs> You need to go do something. You need to go serve somebody. Um, touch grass. Are you being metaphorical? Touch grass is an insult that, that my teenage sons, like my teenagers, it's a, it's a teenage insult right now. It's like if you're too online, uh, it's like go outside and touch grass. Like you're, you need to disconnect from the internet for a little bit. Um, so, no, I mean metaphorically, like go outside, take your shoes off, stand in the grass. You can't tell me something doesn't happen, right? So, um, but man, on the other hand, if you say, man, I'm just always, I'm just really into this emotional thing, I'm just always into, like, the love, the beauty of God, it's like, hey, that's really, really cool. Have you ever thought about reading a book? Right? The thing that got you here won't get you there. If you feel, now, if, it's st if you still feel like, man, yeah, I'm growing, everything's going well, great. All I'm saying is, if you find that you're stalled, if you find that you're not going forward, what I would encourage you to consider is, is it, trying, is it time to do something different? And, you know, really was helpful for me in the last season of my life was this men's group. So now I've joined four men's groups, but I'm not, it's not working for me. It's like, well, have you considered serving in the nursery? Like, do something that's different from what you're doing. Does that make sense? I had a professor in college who used to say, the brain responds to novel stimuli. So he was from South America, or South Africa, and so he had this great accent that I won't even try to do he say the brain responds? I did try it, but this <laughs> so the brain responds to novel stimuli. What that means is, you ever go to a coffee shop? Mm -hmm. First thirty seconds in there, you're like, man, this place smells like coffee. Five minutes later, you're like, there's still coffee. An hour later, you can still smell coffee. But if you work there, you never smell coffee. Because your brain actively filters that out. That's why you have diminishing returns. The brain is wired, hardwired by God to respond to novel stimuli, to new things. The brain responds to things that are new. And so anything that you hear continuously or see or taste or experience, your brain will eventually start to filter that out. I went to college, I lived right by a, um, a train track. A really active train track, and the train always blew the horn at 1 a.m. going through town. And you're like, that's the craziest thing. It would wake everybody up. And when you first move there, the first few nights, you're like, why am I awake? Oh, the train. But after a little while, you just get used to it. And eventually, you don't even notice it anymore. Same thing the first time we ever visited Niagara Falls, right? We went to Niagara Falls, and it's like, holy cow, I can hear the water pouring over Niagara Falls. Just imagine trying to live here. All you'd ever hear is the water. But if you live in Niagara Falls, you don't hear the waterfall. Except a few years ago, when the falls froze over, and everybody in town woke up. <laughs> because it was different. Right? So what I'm saying is that if you're stalled, if that's the kind of stuff that you are, Rather than trying to double down on whatever it is that you've been doing, as worthy a thing as that may be, what you should consider is something different. If you've been serving a lot, maybe it's time to like contemplate beauty or go outside. Maybe you need to stop serving in the nursery for a little while and actually go to worship. <laughs> Sit in the worship service, sing your heart out to God. Maybe you've been singing and singing and singing, it's like, man. It's really great, but um, but what would it look like to do some stuff? What would it look like to whatever it is? Do something different from what you've been doing. All right? Does that make sense? You with me? We're moving on. All right. Third um, <clears throat> third type of stuff is hurt. Sometimes the reason you're not moving forward is because you are wounded. I, uh, I stayed in a hotel last night, Motel 6, actually, not a hotel, a motel. I stayed in a Motel 6, and I flipped on the TV and watched some March Madness, which was fun. I have not watched a minute of college basketball this year until yesterday, because I've just been 
really busy because I'm a work colleague. So um, no, I, I'm, I'm doing better, but in this phase of life, I don't do a lot of TV watching. Um, but it was it was delightful. I love basketball. Um, when I was uh, a teenager, everybody said, "Oh, you're tall. You must play basketball." And I said, if you're short, that doesn't mean you play miniature golf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, teenage me was kind of rude. But, uh, but I didn't really like basketball until I was uh, just about done with high school and I started playing basketball just for fun. I realized, wow, this is actually really fun. And then I, you know, now I enjoy basketball a lot. I like watching it, I like playing it. So I was watching Mar March Madness. I was like, man, this is fun. You know, the teams were playing. I don't even know who was playing, but it was great. It was Memphis and Florida, Florida State, or whatever it was. It was, it was a great game. Um, most of what I watch, when I watch basketball, I watch the NBA. I'm from Indiana. I watch the NBA, Indiana Pacers. It's my team. I was struck by the difference between March Madness basketball and NBA basketball. I'm not anti one or the other. So you guys are like, you like the one, you like the other. But one of the things that's interesting about the NBA is that. Um, Every player in the NBA is always hurt. And I'm not, I'm not being facetious or making fun of them. I'm saying when you play an 82-game schedule plus the postseason, plus a preseason, plus training camp, plus you're playing basketball 24 or 12 months a year, 24 months a year. You're playing basketball 24-7, you're playing basketball 12 months a year. Um, everybody has jammed fingers or a busted knee or a tweaked ankle. Everybody's playing hurt at least a little bit. And uh, Clark Kellogg, who used to be the color announcer for the Indiana Pacers, he used to say, there's a difference between playing hurt and playing injured. Playing hurt means you're playing through pain. Um, and you just have to learn, if you're going to play the NBA, you have to learn how to play through pain. <coughs> I coached uh, my son's third grade basketball team <coughs> this time. I tried really hard not to, and they're like, we need you to be a third coach. You know, they, had, they were going to have two teams. They had too many kids try out. They made three teams, so they wouldn't be a coach for the third team. And I did. I hate... I love basketball, but oh my goodness, third grade boys are just, I can barely handle one, I had 10. Um, but the thing that was the funniest to me was, all the kids were like, he touched me! I was like, yeah, it's basketball, guys, that's how it works. It's like, he just ran into me! We were both going for the rebound and his arm hit my arm! Yeah, no, that's what happens, right? And then it escalated, because the kids were getting, you know, as they started to get more confident in their action, like, more and more injuries happened as the season went on because the kids are just, you know, they don't have coordination, they're running with each other, you know. <laughs> so, last game of the season, we're down by one, and uh, we were trying to, you know, we're trying to teach pick and roll, right, and so I got this kid, Roman, and he's a great kid, and um, he sees that his ball handler is, is almost caught out on the wing, and so he, he's like, all right, let's go set a pick, and so he runs out there, and sets the most amazing moving brick wall pick that I've ever seen. <laughs> he ran out as fast as he could, got to his spot, put his arms down. The kid was coming at him, wasn't looking at all. <laughs> the whole crowd, all the parents, both sides go. <gasps> <laughs> it was loud. <laughs> Ref called him for a moving pick, which was questionable, but I'd have made the same call just because he was moving so fast to get there. I thought he had his position. I thought his feet were set. I thought he was good. Ref didn't think so. I wasn't going to argue about it. Um, plus, all the parents on the other side would probably have killed the ref because it was, he, was, he came in hot. Um, so the ref called him for a foul, and Rowan turns to me. He's, he's crying. He's like, but he ran into me! I know, buddy. That's just the game, buddy. Get out there and do it again. It's <laughs> <laughs> not fair. It's not fair. That's what it is. <laughs> but in the NBA, like, if you're playing 82 games, if you're playing year-round, nobody's ever 100%. All those guys, they finish up and they look like, like they just sit in a freezer. They got so much ice strapped to them, right? Nobody's ever 100%. And if you're waiting to play a good, if you're going to wait to play NBA basketball until you're perfectly healthy, you're never going to get to play. So everybody plays through a little bit of pain. That's different from when you're playing injured. That's a problem. Because when you play injured, you hurt yourself worse. Right? If you go out there and the ankle's not 100%, it's at 95. After the game, it's 90. Or maybe 50. And some of us are used to playing hurt. Playing injured. 
The reason that we're not moving forward anymore is because we can't. I know we're all big, strong, tough men, right? Life will eat you up. <clears throat> and there's been times in my life, I can think of two times in particular, where I kept going because I was the man and I was the provider and that's what I had to do, but I was hurt. And I, mean, I, I kept my job and I was good, but I was not a lot of good to the people around me. Because, uh, you know what they say in AA, her people, her people. Okay? So, if, if the reason you're stuck is that you're hurt, you might need to stop and heal. You might need some time on the bench. Right? You might need to see a doctor. You might need to figure out a plan for how you can not hurt yourself worse by going out and suiting up and playing the game. All right? The last thing is uh, sometimes you're processing, sometimes you're stuck, sometimes you're hurt, sometimes you're crispy. Crispy is when it's not a wound, it's not an injury, you're just all the way empty. You've been pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and there is nothing left in that jar. And you're still pouring out. Every little drop that comes in goes out immediately. All the way dehydrated, all the way exhausted. You're living beyond your limits for a long time. When I was uh, in my 20s, I didn't think I had limits. Like, I don't need to sleep. What are you talking about? Sleep's for six Let's go. Right? I can meet with 50 people in the week, sure. You want, me to, you want me to come over to your house and talk to you on your day off? I'll do that. On my day off? Yeah, I'll do that. Whatever you need. I'm here for the gospel. Any sacrifice. No sacrifice is too great. There's a lot about that that's admirable. There's also part of it where it's like, I think I was afraid that if I wasn't doing stuff for God, that he wouldn't know what I A lot of us live without rest. Breaks one of the Ten Commandments. Keep track of that sort of thing. So this says six days you work, but not the seventh. You're going to work the land seven, six years, but not the seventh. Every 49 years, you're going to take a year off and have a jubilee. Remember this? Built into the structure that God had made for the world is this idea that we're going to work and be fruitful, but we're also going to rest. And if you try and live in this space for too long, you will burn out. And when you burn out, Carrie Newhouse says, it's the kind of tire that a nap doesn't fix. Mm -hmm. When you burn out, it's bad. It's hard. Your emotions stop working. Stop loving people around you. Uh, I wrote down here, this is a quote actually from the book. He said, if you can't feel God's love, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. And that's a good affirmation because when you're burnt out, it's like, I don't know if anybody's there. I don't know if my prayers make it past the sun. Maybe there is a God who doesn't pay attention to me. Our feelings lie to us. And the fertilizer there is something's going to have to change. You will not be able to continue living the way you have been living. Something's going to have to change. That's a longer conversation than we can have here. No matter what kind of stuck you are, I want you to halt, but I don't want you to stop. I say halt. I should have left more space there. Halt. You are about to make a mistake when you make a decision and you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Halt is an acronym for hungry, Angry, lonely, tired. Whatever your pattern of sin is, it will be more prevalent in your life when you are hungry, when you are angry, when you are lonely, and when you are tired. So, no matter what kind of stock you or no matter what kind of stuck you are, I don't want you to stop. I want you to keep on pursuing Jesus, keep pursuing obedience. Keep drawing close to him, even if you don't feel like he is close to you, I promise you he is. But I do want you to halt and avoid making big mistakes if you're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. 
one of my mentors, every February 1st, he posts on Facebook and says, all right, it's February 1st. Nobody make any major life decisions for the next six weeks. Because February, the first part of March, when everything's miserable in the Midwest, it's like, this is terrible. I'm, I gotta make a change, right? It's like, no, you just need for spring. So, <laughs> because um, even the most fruitful things are not fruitful all the time. Amen. Remember that fig tree? The fig tree didn't continue. The, the goal of the master, the master wasn't upset because the fig tree didn't continually bear figs. He was upset because it didn't bear figs in season. There's a season for everything in your life. <clears throat> Unless you live in LA, in which case, like, there's no seasons at all. It's just like that all the time. Right? <laughs> Everywhere else, there are seasons. And there's times of fruitfulness and times of rest. And like the guy said in, in, uh, in the book of Luke, he said, why does it not bear figs in season? If you're looking at your life and you're thinking, I need to be fruitful right now, maybe, maybe you're in a season of rest. David talked about our chickens. Our chickens are great, but they don't lay much in the winter. Because they don't lay much in the winter, they lay really well in the summer. Because those things are seasonal. So part of what you need to do is figure out your own seasons. So, if you are stuck, here's what I want you to know. It happens to all of us. Either it's happened to you in the past, it's happened to you right now, or it's going to happen to you in the future. At some point, you're going to get stuck doesn't mean you're a bad person. It does mean something might need to be fertilized in your life. Right? Whether you're stuck because you're processing, whether you're stuck because you're stalled, whether you're stuck because you're hurt, or whether you're stuck because you're crispy. None of those things is the end. <clears throat> not every day is going to be like this day. Right? God is not done with it. Like the song says, if you're not dead, then he's not done. Right? If you're not dead, then he's not done. So my encouragement to you is, figure out what kind of stuck you are and what does it take to get through it to the days that are ahead. Can I pray for you guys? God, I have no idea who here is here because this was the next workshop or who here is here because I do feel stuck I do feel fruitless I do feel tired or worn out or lost crispy and hurt Father I do not know what's going on in any of this heart but I pray that we would be aware of your presence Father, as far as the east is from the west, you're there. There's nowhere we can go where you are not. So sometimes when we say, I don't think, I don't feel like God is with me. I don't feel it. I don't feel it. And my feelings lie, Father, that you are always true and you are always faithful. And you tell us that you're always with us. So for anybody who's here who feels just distant from you, I pray that you would remind them that you are always with us. Father, if we still feel stuck because you need to complete your work, I pray that you would help that you would help us to cooperate with you so you can complete it for you. Father, if we're hurt, I pray for healing. If we're burned out, I pray for restoration. Father, I pray that your will, your kingdom would come. And that your will would be done on earth as it is now. Father, let us start with us. In your name we pray. Amen.